I encourage everyone to direct with purpose. Now, I know that sounds really simple to say, but it's easy to lose track of the important details in your film that will take it from good to great buried underneath all the other responsibilities you have in your production as the director. Now to help me articulate some of my points, I'm gonna use a reference scene from the film Get Out, the Academy Award winning film from Jordan Peele. Hello. Hello. Hi. I owe you an apology. How rude of me to have touched your belongings without asking. Oh, no, it's cool. I was just confused. Well, I can assure you there was no funny business. This is a scene that every new or young filmmaker should aspire to create. It's not some crazy uh, slow motion of a bullet flying through the air that clips someone and the camera goes through the bullet wound and then zips back around to see his facial express. Dodge this. No, this scene is, is elegant in its simplicity. And for new filmmakers, young filmmakers, growing and learning filmmakers, such as myself, this is the place to start. These are the type of scenes that you should really analyze and look that what makes these scenes great. Spectacle is fantastic, but the essence of filmmaking, I think, lies within the details. And that's what this scene does well. you should start small. Now that's not to say you can't dream big or aspire to grow into something. I think you need to try and set yourself up for success every time out. And I think making the game smaller is the way to do that. I'll give you a sports analogy to put it in some context for you. The equivalent of you going out and trying to show off your filmmaking ability with stunts and special effects, crazy budgets, helicopters, whatever, is the equivalent of a high school basketball player going out and warming up by taking half court shots. It's just not the intelligent approach to developing your craft and your skill set. Now, there are some LeBron Jameses out there who can do that. There are some Steph Currys who can go out and drop 40 footers. Curry from half court. Oh, he puts it in. If you're watching this video, you may not be one of those people. And neither am I. So let's grow together. This is where you want to start. A simple scene like this that creates such emotion and power from it. <laughs> oh. oh, no. 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 No, 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 no. I love this scene. I love everything about it. I I think it builds very, very well. There are three choices that I think are being made that really lead this scene to be what it is. I think that's the lens choice. I think that's the camera angle. And I think it's the blocking of the actors. Three directorial choices that you will have to make in your next film. And these three things all work together in a really powerful way. Let's start with the lens choice. As a director, it's something you're gonna to have to choose. I can look at the scene and I can immediately tell that there are two different focal lengths being used, one for each character. If we start with Chris, if I had to guess, he's being shot on a 50 millimeter lens or something around that range. Now, if you don't know, a 50 millimeter lens is, is a, a, a equivalent to how your eye naturally sees the world. Anything longer or anything shorter starts to then change the perspective of how you see depth. The longer the lens, the more uh, depth is compressed. The wider the lens, the more depth is elongated, essentially. So I look at Chris and he is, uh, again, that lens portrays a very normal way of interacting with someone, a very normal way to look at someone. It's how your eye naturally sees things, relatively speaking. The housekeeper, on the other hand, is shot with a much wider lens. If I had to guess, it's probably a 35, a 25, maybe a 21, but there's definitely a wider feel to it. The space becomes elongated. Her face fills up more of the frame. It pulls things apart. It's, it's a very unnatural way 
of looking at something. So that in itself gives this character a more eerie feel than Chris. Just like that, just by using that lens. Her face becomes to, becomes, starts to creep bigger and a pres more of a presence in this frame versus Chris, who has more of a normal look to him. Let's look at the camera placement. The camera angle, camera placement, where is the camera? We're interacting with her at a lower angle, which immediately, as I'm sure you know at this point, shooting characters at a lower angle, it puts them in a place of power, pl a place of intimidation. If you shoot someone down, it's like you're looking down on them. If they're smaller, they're, they look weaker, they look more frail. So she is spread out, fill, her face filling more of the frame because of the wide angle lens, and we're below her, we're, we're cowering underneath her in a, in a way. So those two choices immediately are red flags that this is a menacing character. This is someone who I should be afraid of. Something is not right here. And I know that without having to hear her talk, without knowing anything about her, I, I don't have to know anything. I could watch this scene on mute if I wanted to, and immediately know that's a bad guy. That's, that, that is a villain. Something's wrong with this. Now let's go to the last piece, which is my favorite piece, and I think the most intelligent piece of this scene. The last piece is the blocking, and I'll, and I'll put a little bit of the, the acting in there as well, because I assume that's a directorial decision. Let's go back to the top of the scene. She starts out far away from the camera and slowly creeps in. She slowly pushes in. Chris has the wall right behind him. Chris, our main character, can't go anywhere. And this is the scene, I think, that really defines that everything is closing in on him. This scene is where I think you really start to realize that nothing is safe. Everything is coming closer and closer, and you get a sense of claustrophobia, if that's the right way to pronounce it, from this one scene. And it really sets the tone for the rest of the movie. So let's look at the blocking of Chris. Chris is not straight flesh with her. He's not presenting himself like he's tough or like he's strong. He's like this, he's turned to the side and he's kind of looking over his shoulder. That's a very weak position. He looks like he can't go anywhere. He looks as if he's a small child sort of hiding in a corner from somebody. Now his, his tone and, and his general stature doesn't project that, but that's, but that's what the direction is telling me. Not the character, the direction. So I can tell all of these things, all of these things equate to this woman is a problem and everything is coming down on him. The Armitages are so good to us. They treat us like family. This film is directed with a purpose. A very, very clear thought process has gone into everything about this. Are you taking the same time to make your artistic choices speak this loud? If you're not, you should reevaluate. I like to start with, how do I want my audience to feel? Are they going to laugh? Are they going to cry? Are they going to be scared? Are they going to be tense? Are they going to poop their pants? It doesn't matter <laughs> what it is, but you have to establish that before you establish anything. If you think about it, films are more felt than they are understood. They create feelings. Everybody's interpretation is different. If you went out and you watched The Joker, for argument's sake, people will argue about what the actual film was and what actually happened to Arthur Fleck, but there'll be less confusion on how people felt about it. They felt uncomfortable, I'll guarantee it. The feeling will remain consistent. The interpretation of what actually happens can be a mystery. So the emotion almost becomes the most important part of what you're trying to achieve. So without it, how can you make these director decisions? I don't think you can. So the first thing you need to do in your pre-production process is establish your emotions. Okay, so if this scene was gonna be a comedy, if this scene in Get Out was supposed to be fun or funny, or these decisions, these would all be different, would all be different. So if you don't know what emotion you're trying to get at, you're, you're, you're shooting, you're not directing. 
pre-production is where you can make your mistakes. Pre-production is where you can get crazy. Pre-production is where you try and you test and you live and you learn. That's what pre-production is for. The three things that you need to do for pre-production are, I think you need to develop shot list. And if you don't know what shot list is, just Google it. There's a thousand images out there and you can just make your own version of that. It's simple. Uh, I can show you a quick version of mine. That's what I do. You don't have to do that. You can do whatever you want. Storyboards would be two. Personally, I prefer shot lists over storyboards only because I can't draw. The goal of a storyboard is just to visually start to put together what things are gonna look like in a loose, rough framing. You learn a little bit about composition, you learn about how things are gonna flow together from shot to shot, wide, tight, medium, blah, 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 blah. Thirdly, table reads or rehearsals. I really do urge you to go through your rehearsals uh, or table reads because seeing it and hearing it from other people are, is completely different than running through it in your head. It's a, it's a necessary step. I really believe getting your vision, your work off of you and out of you and putting it in front of you and, and hearing your words read if you've written the script, the writer I would think should be there too, to hear the words spoken, delivered, performed in some cases, and then see the action, how it unfolds, because you obviously have all this stuff in your head, you have it in your shot list, you may have it in your storyboards, but when you start to really start to see it together and you see how it works, you will learn, you will learn many new things. And that stuff is invaluable because what you don't wanna do, and I can't stress it enough, is start making those changes on the fly because things are gonna erode no matter what. That's just the production life. As I've heard Martin Scorsese say before, uh, he would go to his DP and say, what can't we do today? That's how we would start every day. And, and I think that's what, that's what production really is. It's, it's a list of things you wish you could have done. So pre-production will limit all of that exposure as much as possible. There's knowing that there's gonna be things that you're, are out of your control and you can't change. And that's okay too, you have to be flexible. But why not try and limit that? So I do believe that your rehearsals and your, and, and your table reads blocking things out beforehand, seeing it unfold in front of you and going back and making revisions off of that so that when you get there, you're as tight as possible, that, that's, gonna, that's gonna elevate your production completely. Time management is so important as a director and something I learned the hard way. You do not wanna be a person who pushes their crew beyond their limits. Never be that guy. Just don't do it. The things you need to incorporate into your schedule are setup, breakdown, run-throughs, production execution, and performances. All of those things take time. Mainly setup, understanding how long a scene is going to take to build before your actors even get there, before the cameras start rolling, before your performances start happening. That is a huge advantage. Do not overlook your setup times. Because how elaborate is your scene? How elaborate is your lighting? That all takes time. So if you plan a day to do a shoot and it takes seven hours just to set up, well, how much time do you really have left to shoot? You have to be willing to make concessions when it comes to the safety and the sanity of your crew. Don't be too stubborn to do that. If you do make the mistake, you do start to run late. Add another day to your production if you can, or, the, or unfortunately you may have to start to cut things. And those are the things that you want to avoid and you can avoid by understanding how to manage time and working through your pre-production. Here's my last bit of advice and write this down. I will wait. I'm actually not gonna wait. Don't do something because it's cool. Just don't do it. This applies to anything in production, not only directing, but especially in directing. Don't do something because you like it or because it's cool or because you saw someone else do it. That is the worst answer and it drives me insane when anyone makes a creative decision and I ask them, and I always do, I will always ask you, why did you do that? Why is that shot there? Why is that line of dialogue there? Why did you edit it that way? Why is it color corrected that way? And if your answer is, oh, I liked it, I thought it was cool, I saw it on TV the other night and I wanted to try it, it shouldn't be in your film. It's a terrible answer. Have cause for what you do. That's the whole point of this video, is direct with purpose. 
have a purpose in what you do. See what I did there? It's full circle. It's full circle, folks. Have conviction for what you do. Even if it's wrong, even if it's terrible, I don't care. You can say, Keith told me to do it, and it doesn't matter if it sucked, because it doesn't. The result is not why you should be doing things. You should be doing things because you believe in the story you're telling. You believe in how you are communicating that story. All of those things add up. Every decision you make equals a great story. And any piece that's not working towards your overall theme, your overall story, your overall narrative, whatever it is, if all of these pieces underneath are not equating to this, then it has no business in your production. I, I promise you, it has not. If this is just in here because you like it, because it's cool, because you wrote it, because whatever, because your mom wants it in, it is making your film worse. Get rid of it. The thing you should do always, without a doubt, in production and in your real life is don't be cool, be you.